and Bruno as well for your invitation to, to give a seminar um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the department, at the nuclear physics department at Barcelona. Uh, um, this is, let's say, an honor to me. And, and, um, and since uh, uh, I hope there might be, uh, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, kind of broad idea and audience. Let's say not everybody will be conversant with with uh, the topics I will be uh, talking about today. Uh, I was thinking to uh, to give some kind of uh, let's say um, good motivation uh, on the different aspects and to also try to uh, explain uh, uh, the basic uh, ideas. So uh, you feel free uh, to to interrupt me if you believe uh, if you believe uh, uh, some point needs to be uh, needs to be solved before I can go further. Uh, otherwise, you can also wait until the end, so there is no no problem for that. Uh, I cannot see uh, while well, I am sharing my screen. I cannot see the chat, so please, uh, are now if you see some kind of comment in the chat, please let me know. Otherwise, I will not I will not stop. Um, okay, so let's 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 then start. Uh, so uh, as you see, my topic it's uh, or the title of my talk, my lecture it's kind of uh, very specific. So the, the the symmetry energy and and how is this related to the breaking of the isospin symmetry, uh, and if it uh, uh, is in contradiction or not uh, with what we have learned about this symmetry energy. Um, this symmetry energy, as you will see, is related to the nuclear equation of state. So this is a very important uh, topic to us for nuclear physics and also for nuclear astrophysics application. OK, so uh, as I was saying, I will start with a motivation. And then I will try to, to explain you in a, in, a, in a few words, let's say, in a general way, uh, uh, the theoretical approach uh, uh, we are using, which is based on this density functional theory. Uh, there are, of course, other approaches that I will try to, to, to briefly comment. And then I will go to the main topic, which is to explain you what it is as a body kind of state uh, and, and why this, uh, uh, this is important in the context of spin symmetry breaking. Uh, and then I, will, I would like to find, uh, to, 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 to conclude uh, my, my seminar by uh, uh, also giving some future perspectives. So uh, some topics we are working in, in our group here in Milano, uh, just to let you know which are, uh, which are some possible interesting topics in which in which nuclear physicists are nowadays working on, or some nuclear physicists are nowadays nowadays working on. Okay, so the, uh, this is probably one of the most important slides. So uh, in this slide, uh, I define what I, we call the nuclear equation of state. So in nuclear physics, uh, we call the nuclear equation of state to the energy per nucleon of an infinite system of neutrons and protons. This is an ideal system, but it's useful uh, as you will see now. So um, uh, this equation of state can be treated, or, or we can call the equation of state the energy per nucleon, because you can, uh, you can assume zero temperature. Uh, this is because even though very, very large temperatures, like 10 to the 10 Kelvin, uh, are only around 1 MeV. I, re I remind you that the MeV uh, scale is the scale of nuclei, more or less. OK, so this nuclear equation of state, uh, at least for densities which are uh, around densities, nucleon densities, I mean, are around, uh, let's say, very small, two, uh, two times the saturation density that I will define later, it can be uh, written as, as in, this, uh, uh, in this box, uh, red box I put in the slide, so uh, as in this way. Uh, and this energy per particle uh, can be split into two parts. Uh, and the first part is what we call the symmetric matter equation of state, and we call it symmetric because it just depends on the total density, so the sum of the neutron plus the, neutron, the proton densities, plus uh, one part, this we call this, as we call the symmetry energy, uh, times uh, this parameter delta, which uh, gives you an idea on how uh, much uh, neutrons and protons you have, or the other way around, uh, by parameterizing uh, the densities neutron minus uh, proton density. So this is, we can also call it the asymmetry term uh, because it gives you uh, a penalty energy to the, uh, to the total energy uh, for converting, if you want, all uh, neutrons into protons uh, in, a, in, a, in, in your, let's say, system of infinite number of neutrons and protons. 
this uh, expression here assumes uh, as a spin conserving as you can see this delta appears only only uh, to the square so there is no difference if you have more or less more neutrons or more protons the the pen, the, the, N, the NSD penalty uh, will be the same and this uh, let's say um, this um, way of writing the equation of state is fully general and it has been seen to be accurate as i was saying before uh, for a uh, let's say broad range of, of densities it is also customary in the field to try to parameterize uh, to if you want to expand and these uh, expressions around what we call the saturation density uh, so if you look at the at the at the figure here uh, what i'm plotting and by using the, the green color is the symmetric matter equation of state that it saturates it saturates uh, at uh, 0.16 fermi to the minus three this we know from electron elastic scattering uh, and and it is believed to saturate at minus 16 MeV, although this is a, a bit uh, controversial for example our chairman uh, has published recently a paper which says that this is not quite true it, the, the energy might be slightly different than minus 16 MeV. Uh, but that's not the point now here so the point now is to know that uh, the symmetric matter equation of state saturates and saturates to a point and this is telling you that actually the uh, what you the density and energy you find inside the nucleus will be very well approximated by these numbers here okay when in, inside the nucleus why because then you can let's say uh, neglect the surface effect because remember the nuclear interaction is a short range interaction okay uh, then in blue i'm plotting you uh, the equation of a state if i put it delta to be one if i put delta to be one i will to be saying that I just have neutrons, so I call that neutron matter equation of state. And what the difference between these two, you can easily understand from this formula, is just uh, what we call the symmetry energy. As I was saying, it is customary to uh, expand this equation of state around saturation density because this is the density at which uh, nuclei likes to stay, more or less. Uh, and therefore, uh, this will allow us to define some meaningful parameters uh, when we study some observables to characterize these parameters by using the study of these observables will also characterize the equation of state because we will be looking at the, uh, de at the densities, more or less, at which these observables are sensitive, which are, as I was saying again, uh, the, the, the separation density. So sorry if I repeat myself a bit, but I wanted this, uh, let's say, these uh, concepts to be to be kind of clear. Uh, after doing this, uh, let's say, Taylor expansion around saturation, so I call saturation rho zero, uh, you can define different parameters to just, such as uh, K zero, J, L, or this K sim. Uh, for example, we know well that this uh, K zero parameter uh, uh, is related to the giant monopole resonance. So how the nucleus, how easy or difficult is to compress the nucleus? That's why we, uh, Indeed, uh, a nucleus, let's say a kind of symmetric nucleus, of course, because in that case it's defined in the symmetric matter equation of state. And then the, gen, the J is the, the, the symmetry energy, the value of the symmetry energy at saturation. So this difference, but, uh, but calculated at the saturation density. Uh, at the saturation density, this is uh, uh, usually around 30 MeV. And, and it's, as I was saying before, it's uh, the penalty for converting all protons into neutrons in symmetric nuclear matter. From symmetric nuclear matter. And then L is a parameter which is proportional to the neutron pressure uh, in new, uh, to the neutron pressure uh, around saturation density. So it is telling you how neutrons like if how ne neutrons push other neutrons which are around, if they put, push them uh, strongly or, 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 or uh, let's say um, yeah, or, or softer, let's say somehow. And this is very important as we will see, as we will see in this talk. Uh, okay, so um, uh, what, uh, since we will be talking about the symmetry energy, what nuclear models predict uh, for the symmetry energy nowadays? So this we can see in this figure. So in the, this is the symmetry energy in the, in the, in the vertical axis, uh, and in the horizontal axis you get the, the density, total density, baryon density, divided by the saturation density. Okay, so if you look at one, you will be looking at the saturation density. In the right hand side, you will see models that we call in nuclear physics up initial models because they are based on, on, on effective Hamiltonian, uh, which have been fitted to, uh, uh, to few body data. 
so to a uh, nuclear nucleon scattering design vacuum or to few body uh, nuclei, kind of, I don't know, helium 3, for example. And then uh, some sound and, 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 and uh, many body approach is applied to solve this Hamiltonian. And then you get the, 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 the result. Let's say, for example, in this case, the equation, so the symmetry energy. So this quantity, uh, which is very important in the equation. And these, um, these models are called up initial because these effective Hamiltonians uh, are assumed to contain some connection to the, uh, let's say, fundamental Hamiltonian that would be the, 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 the QCD Hamiltonian. Uh, some of them are more phenomenological than others, but uh, all of them are assumed to have some uh, clear connection, let's say somehow. On the other side, there are in the left hand side, uh, what I'm showing you is uh, some uh, uh, nuclear energy density functionals. Those are also based on effective Hamiltonians, but the difference is that they are solved at the simplest many body uh, method you can think of, so the Hartree Fock uh, approximation. And then the, the parameters are not fitted to few body data, uh, as in the previous case, but are fitted to many body data. And it doesn't matter what you do, as you can see in these figures, the symmetry energy is not well constrained by the data. Uh, this is very important. Uh, if you want to study, for example, uh, Newton stars, because then you need to go to very high densities. If you assume the Newton star is made just of neutrons, then you need to go to very large densities. And there, uh, models, doesn't matter the model you take, the type of model you take, then the, 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 the predictions will be very different. OK. So uh, astrophysical observations will be very important on that sense. Uh, if you look at the saturation density, you see that uh, both type of uh, models, let's say, or all models, if you want, are, let's say, better in, in better agreement than if you look to larger densities. Uh, but anyway, this the figure is very large. Uh, I mean, the scale of this figure doesn't allow you to see that actually also at the saturation density, these, these models differ a lot in order to give a precise description, for example, of uh, binding energies, charge radii, charge radii, radii in, in nuclei, etc. So uh, for example, let me go to now to an example on the, on the astrophysical context. So um, uh, imagine that you have a neutron star, so and you assume this neutron star is only made of neutrons, and you want to solve the so-called thurman oppenheimer volkov equation that will give you the mass radius relation of a neutron star. And you say, okay, so let me assume that this is like a white dwarf, which is supported by the degeneracy pressure of electrons. But now let me assume that this is supported by the degeneracy pressure of neutrons. So I forget about nuclear, nuclear interaction. Uh, what that we get is that uh, the maximum possible uh, neutron star mass will be 0 0.7 uh, solar masses. And then you go to the observation and say, okay, let me see what, uh, observe, uh, what uh, observers have uh, found uh, out there. So they, uh, today, up today, uh, they, there exist, or we know there exist, two uh, neutron stars which two times uh, the, uh, the, the, the mass of the sun. So this means that uh, there is something uh, which is missing. Uh, with this missing, in going from 0 0.7 solar mass maximum, star, uh, maximum mass of a neutron star to two solar masses, uh, what this missing is a uh, nuclear physics, OK? And that's uh, good for nuclear physicists, uh, uh, but not that good for astrophysics, because uh, as you have seen before, uh, nuclear physicists doesn't know how to predict the equation of state at very large density. So what they end up is all, with all these curves you see, for example, in blue, in green, or in, or in uh, magenta, where, uh, where uh, you get very different predictions for the neutron star mass radius relation. So, for example, these uh, two solar mass measurement already rule out some of the equations of state, and that's what we want to do to do to, to get, let's say, from nuclear astrophysics, is to tell us how we need to constrain our equation of state at high densities, uh, and at, at some moment match the high densities with the lower densities from the let's say laboratory, laboratory data, and to learn about the equation of state. Okay, so here the main point is that the nuclear physics input is. Uh, I mean, it's fundamental. Okay, so let me show you uh, another another example on, on nuclear astrophysics. So recently, uh, there have been uh, measured uh, the gravitational waves coming from a binary uh, neutron star merger, and this also set some constraints on the nuclear equation of state. Why? Because when these uh, neutron stars are, let's say, merging, the the gravitational field is so large uh, that the these neutrons these these neutron stars get the form 
Okay, so this is the formation of the, of the neutral star depends on the nuclear equation of state, and uh, and and therefore it uh, they also are able to put some constraints. So here is another again in the left hand side another mass radius relation uh, figure, and where uh, different models are uh, shown. Those are all uh, density functional theory, uh, density based on density functional theory. In the previous slide there were very different models uh, plotted there, but here is just for illustration. So and uh, these two arrows, this uh, pink or let's say violet arrow, are pointing out uh, the constraints from from that would be on the constraints on the neutron star radius that would be uh, let's say uh, compatible uh, with uh, with the gravitational wave uh, signal. On the right hand side, instead, I'm showing you also uh, the let's say the tidal deformability, which is related. On, how, uh, on the on the on, on the on, on, on what I was saying before, so how much this neutron star deform? And as you see, also here there are some they put some constraints. So this deformability should be lower than a certain than a certain value. And here the dots represent different models. So you see also that this this observation also constrain what we know about the equation of state at, at high densities. I'm telling high densities. Sorry, I, I was assuming that uh, all, all you know, but maybe not all of you know, that in the Newton star, the densities that you can get, for example, in the center of the star, can reach four, five, six times saturation density. So you may be, uh, you, you may be in the, let's say, in the worst case, where uh, we know nothing about the nuclear equation of state. Okay, so but uh, what can we learn uh, from the Earth uh, at let's say lower densities? So uh, one of the most paradigmatic uh, observable that help us learning about the equation of state is what we call the neutron skin thickness, which is the difference between the neutron, the, the Rubin square new, uh, radius of neutrons and protons, and and why uh, this is related to the equation of state. So if you think about the parameter L, which is proportional to the neutron pressure uh, in nuclei. And you think you are looking at a neutron rich nucleus where you have a lot of more neutrons than protons and this pressure is very large so neutrons will be like will be uh, uh, will like to be far apart from each other uh, what that what this means this means that the neutron radius will be much larger than the proton one and then you will have a kind of uh, skin made only of of neutrons the larger the pressure the larger the skin this can be understood right so if you look at the current models in this left hand side picture uh, figure, uh, you see the neutron skin in left to right as a function of the, uh, this L, which is proportional to the, to the pressure, neutron pressure, and you see that it is uh, linearly correlated. So it is not only correlated, it is also actually linearly correlated and very nicely compounded. This type of physics can be as seen in the radius of a star. So if you go to a star in which the densities are not very large, so where the neutron pressure around saturation may be kind of meaningful, uh, uh, then uh, you will see also that the neutron star radius will grow as, as this L parameter grows. Here, I'm not, sh I'm not showing the radius of a, let's say, uh, of a light neutron star as a function of L, but I'm showing up as a function of the neutron skin in left, which, as you see from the left hand side picture, it's like talking about the same thing. So you see also this type of different models that predict that the, the larger is the neutron pressure at saturation density, at nuclear saturation density, as larger is the radius in a low uh, mass neutron star. This gets blurred when you go to heavier neutron stars because densities which are important are, are higher and therefore uh, our knowledge uh, of this uh, neutron pressure is less good. Okay, this is another observable which is called the, the, the parity violating as, uh, asymmetry, which is also known to be uh, rather well correlated with this neutron skin and therefore to the to the to the to this neutron pressure. I will not go into detail since I am afraid I'm, I will get so 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 long in my talk. But we can come later if you like. Uh, Xavi, can I can I ask you something? Yes, sure. Um, these these correlations that they, they are very nice. This one and, and the one in the slide before. Uh, this you have studied very carefully uh, within the uh, mean field like models, right? Yes. Uh, do you expect similar or how, how much do you expect the linear correlation survive in ab initio calculations or, or what is your feeling uh, towards that? 
So I haven't I haven't seen the same plot uh, by using a initial correlation. Uh, my feeling my feeling is that uh, this correlation is quite um, simple from uh, the physical point of view. So I was trying to convince you about that actually when I was saying that the larger the pressure between among neutrons, the larger will be the neutron spin. This is nothing it has nothing to do with density functional or initial or whatever. It has to do with a simple physical mechanism, okay? Uh, therefore, what I expect is that in this specific case, which is kind of, if you want, simple, about, uh, for example, the radius of a low mass neutron star or the, or the, or the, or the neutron skin uh, of a neutron rich nucleus, then I, should, I, would, I would expect the same. If I don't get the same, uh, uh, probably the first thing I will think is something is wrong, but not on, the, on this, uh, way of thinking. I will think something is wrong about the calculation. That's my feeling. But okay, thanks. I haven't checked. OK, so if we go uh, further and we want to, for example, um, uh, we can look, for example, we can stop here in this slide here. So uh, before we were looking uh, at, the, at the quadrupole deformation. So this tidal deformability in the star is actually the quadrupole deformation of the of the mass distribution of the star, but you can also look at the uh, at the deformation of the charge density in nuclei in the same way. Okay, in this case, the leading term is not the quadrupole, like in the in the case of the when you have the gravitational field, uh, when you have the electromagnetic field, the leading term is the dipole. Okay, the dipole deformability. Uh, in this case, you may think in a nucleus that you put in a condensator, for example, uh, and you turn on the electric field. And depending on the on the on the equation of state, actually, uh, the the nucleus will be uh, more or less deformed, as it happened for the neutron star, the same way. Uh, if you study that, you can also again realize that uh, this should be connected with the equation of state. We have studied that, and we have seen that actually it has been it can be related a, in a kind of simple term uh, with the with the parameters of the equation of state. Uh, those, uh, those which are specifically related to the symmetry energy. And then we have set some, some let's say, we have, uh, we have set some constraint by using experimental data in the laboratory uh, to, some, uh, to, some, to some, let's say, uh, nuclear mass. Uh, in, this case, uh, in this case, also, since the um, physics which is behind uh, this observable is very transparent, I would also expect a similar relation uh, uh, given by a initial, but as I was telling before, I, I have never uh, confirmed this. Okay, so uh, let's say, uh, let me give you another example, which is important uh, in my opinion, and it is the following. So um, uh, if you want to study also neutron stars, but in that case, you don't want, you want to study something more detailed. So which are in the outer crust uh, of the star or in the crust of the star, which are the nuclei present there? So in the outer crust, uh, we know that it should be arranged uh, in a in a coulomb in a crystal coulomb lattice. Uh, nuclei should be arranged in a coulomb crystal lattice and embedded on a on a free Fermi gas. So the densities are uh, high enough to ionize nuclei in this uh, crystal, and 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 and, and therefore and, and therefore uh, this uh, this uh, this. Uh, so if you want, I can say it in another way. Densities are enough to ionize the nuclei. Therefore, nuclei see each other and form this crystal lattice. Uh, to understand which nuclei will form this crystal lattice as a function of the density or the pressure, uh, you need, again, nuclear physics. And, and since the densities are very large, very neutron-rich nuclei not possible to synthesize in the Earth. Uh, appear uh, as a uh, as a constituent of the of the of the of the crust of the star, and 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 you can see in this figure here. So maybe you cannot see very well, but I tell you. So this will be uh, the depth on the on the on the on the vertical axis. These are three different uh, nuclear models, very accurate nuclear models. Actually, those are. This is a density function based on density functional theory. Uh, this is uh, uh, based on a macroscopic microscopic model, and this is based on a refinement using uh, using neural network uh, uh, techniques. And, and all of them give not very different compositions, but different composition of the of the crust. And this is mainly driven by the symmetry energy again, because if you are building nuclei or you 
you see that you, it's convenient energetically to build very neutron rich nuclei. And this will be, let's say, uh, ruled by the symmetry energy, which will tell you, no, you, you can do more or less, or you can produce nuclei with more or less neutrons, and depending on this pressure. If the pressure is very large, it won't, it won't be convenient. If the pressure is very low, it will be convenient to produce a lot of neutrons. Uh, OK, so uh, well, I don't, I'm not going into detail. Of course, you can ask me uh, later if you like, but uh, it's just to give you the a rough, a rough idea. And of course, depending on the composition of this, of this crust, when you have, for example, this merging of neutron stars, a lot of uh, this uh, nuclei, neutron is nuclei, will be, let's say, uh, uh, somehow um, will be a product of this of this merger, and 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 therefore it will be important uh, to understand uh, to understand, uh, for example, the 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 production of of of, of heavy elements. Uh, uh, the production of heavy elements. So that's if you want it. That's important for the for the for the art processing in, uh, in the, for the art process production. Let's say. Okay. Finally, uh, one of the other example I wanted to tell you is if you study uh, the, the 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 dipole response. So again, if you look at this nucleus in the condensator, and 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 and, and uh, the nucleus, as I was saying before, it gets the form. But if you look uh, in this experiment at the, what we call the strength function, so the response of the nucleus at the different energies of the, in this case, of the probe you use. Uh, so instead of a condensator, we don't use a condensator, you use a probe, which has some electric charge. And if you look at this, at the function of different energies, you get this figure I'm showing you in the left-hand side. And if you integrate this quantity here divided by the energy, you get the polarizability. But if you don't integrate, you just look at the full uh, strength distribution, you will see that in neutron rich nuclei, there are, there, is some, there are some peaks at low energy. This, is, this happens because in neutron rich nuclei, this neutron skin appears. This uh, neutron pressure is large. So you kind of decorrelate these neutrons, push them, uh, or some of the neutrons, sorry, some of the neutrons, you push them uh, quite away from the, let's say, what we can call core, where we have protons and neutrons mixed. And, and therefore, uh, since those new neutrons, you can think about them as kind of decorrelated from the core, they will show large, large transitions at low energy. And this is important to, to take into account, for example, this, uh, the, the effect or this effect. It is important, for example, if you want to study, to study uh, the relative abundances of elements uh, in our solar system. So here, just to, just to mention, so the difference between these two curves, okay, is if I only take into account the effect of this giant dipole resonance, and if I take into account the giant dipole resonance plus this, this small, let's say, this, this other peak at lower energies that we call the pygmy dipole resonance. So in one case, you are not able to explain all the peaks, but in the other case, you are able to explain the peak. And of course, depending on the model, this peak here will be different because the larger the pressure, you would expect this peak to be different because the more they correlated the neutrons, the, the largest, the largest the peak and the, and the lowest energy. Okay, so let me go now to the to the to our let's say to our problem. So to the to the problem that uh, takes our uh, most of our time. So here is just to show you for those who are not let's say familiar with. Uh, just uh, just a piece of the nuclear potential, so the, what we call the central part of the nuclear potential. And in the left hand side, I'm showing you different potential, those that I, I call, uh, that I, or people call phenomenological, uh, where you propose an interaction and you fit to uh, nuclear nuclear scattering data in the vacuum and few body data, like the, well, I don't know, the energy of ion 3, as I was saying before. Uh, here, another example in which you use lattice QCD to derive this central power of the potential. And as you can see, already at this level uh, on the phenomenological side, what, we call, what I call phenomenological side, is uh, you get a very different potentials. Uh, you see here that the difference in the, in the minimum of this potential is uh, it's, uh, not 100 MeV, but uh, not far, let's say. Uh, from lattice QCD, you see uh, that uh, actually uh, they are predicting a minimum, which is even, uh, let's say, smaller in absolute value as compared to the smallest one in this case. 
So you need to know that all these three potentials predict nuclear nuclear scattering data in the vacuum, but they are not able to, let's say, uh, constrain the, 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 the nuclear effective interaction, at least in this channel. And the other channels are the same somehow, if you, if you want to have a rough picture of the system. And also you see that uh, those are very different and, and all of these, so all the calculation we based on all these on all these potentials is what we call in the previous figure. So in the second figure, maybe when I was showing you the symmetry energy as a function of the density, this is everything what we call a initial because we can connect or we know how to connect these potentials. We know, we believe that it should be easier to connect these potentials to the let's say, fundamental theory, which is QCP. Uh, now, I, after this very brief, let's say, uh, words, uh, now I move to, to my topic, which is the, the density functional theory, which is another approach possible to address the nuclear many body problem. So you can also say, OK, I forget about everything because it's very complicated, this Hamiltonian, this many body technique, which are very also, very, also very complicated. So now I want to simplify things. And thanks to Hoy and Berekon, uh, that they, they tell us that you can simplify things. Maybe you cannot address the, the description of all observables, all possible observables, but you may be able to describe a lot of observables anyway, and in an exact way, which is a very, uh, a very tempting, let's say, option. So the, this the Hoy and Berekon, as you as you know very well, uh, are telling you that uh, a universal functional of the density when you have an interactive system of fermions. Uh, exist and that this uh, functional of the density has a minimum uh, for the exact ground state uh, where it assumes the exact energy as a value. So this is very nice, but it's telling you nothing actually because but it, it, no, it's not, not telling you nothing, it's telling you it exists. Okay, so if you want to study this, you may be able to find the exact energy density functional, so the exact equation of the state, the exact binding energy for all nuclei, and all of them describe it theoretically in a let's say, within a very nice theoretical frame. The problem is that, uh, I mean, the, the, the authors of obviously realized is how to build this functional. We don't know how to build this functional, have no idea because there is no recipe, there's no magical recipe to build this functional. So Kone Shan at some point decided, okay, we will propose a, a way to, to build this, uh, which is not uh, uh, fully solving all the problems, but it's solving part of the problems. And what they say, okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's assume that for any interacting system, there exists, uh, uh, well, they show, sorry, no, they, they didn't assume, they show that uh, for any interacting system, there exists a local single uh, particle potential that we will call the Konishan potential, such that the exact energy of the ground state uh, is equal to the one of the interacting system. And, uh, and, uh, and this can be seen easily. I mean, this can be seen in a picture way in this in this figure here. So uh, you uh, from from left to right, you take out the interaction between the particles, and you assume those particles are confined in a in a given in a given let's say condition potential. Okay, so I think the idea is clear. Um, okay, usually uh, this condition potential is is uh, split in different pieces. So. Uh, 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 an external potential in the case you are studying, for example, uh, electrons that they will not bound by themselves. But in the case you are studying nuclei, the external potential is not needed because nuclei are self-bound. Uh, then uh, you have a Hartree, uh, Hartree term. Why Hartree term? Because in, uh, for also again, in electronic systems, uh, you know how to calculate the Hartree contribution of the Coulomb potential very well. Uh, and therefore, and this will be the main contribution, and therefore it will re just remain the external potential that you control as you like in your calculation, can be, for example, harmonic oscillator, or also you control well in the experiment. And, and then the remaining pair, so the difficult part in electronic systems will be the charge exchange correlation, uh, the exchange correlation part, that you need to find a, a suitable density dependent form by uh, using, I mean, uh, your knowledge on the field, um, more precise calculations or calculations that we believe are exact in some specific cases, etc. In the case of nuclei, as I was saying, the exchange correlation, uh, sorry, the, the external potential is not, uh, it's zero because nuclei are self-bound, so we don't need the external potential, we put it to zero. But then the heart rate, the heart rate, we need to calculate the heart rate, uh, the heart rate contribution uh, of a some given interaction, and we don't know the interaction. So what we do is just to uh, propose 
assume, give us an hypothesis, some interaction, so beta the Hartree level, and then uh, and then what we do is since we don't want to calculate correlations, which are very difficult, we say, okay, let's calculate just uh, the fog term that we know how to calculate, the fog term, which is easier, and then assume that all the correlations that we are neglecting uh, uh, are in a, uh, are, um, are contained in the parameters uh, after you feed the interaction. So you, feed your, you, you, you solve at the hartree fock level this uh, interaction, that effective interaction they assume, you fit, as I was saying before, to uh, uh, many body nuclear data, kind of heavy nuclei, uh, charge ID of heavy nuclei, the masses or whatever you like. And then you assume, okay, all correlations I have been explicitly neglecting will be included in, the, in this parameter. This is a very dangerous way of proceeding uh, because uh, if there was no Hohenberg cone theorem, because you are not controlling these correlations. But since you have this theorem, uh, we usually believe we are we may be lucky, and then <laughs> and then to adopt this kind of strategy is uh, you want a, a good first step uh, to take. Okay, so here more or less I say the same, just to mention that uh, uh, current nuclear models based on the strategy I just uh, described are able to reproduce nuclear masses and in charity within one to one per mil accuracy, which is not bad. The problem is experiments are even more uh, precise than that, but okay, I mean, we, we get this. Uh, we are also with density functional theory uh, to uh, describe giant resonances, such as the dipole resonance that we need to, 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 to calculate this polarizability I was saying, or this, uh, uh, this low energy peak in the dipole response that I, I was also showing. So they are now, when compared to experiment, these models to be rather good, maybe at the 1% level. Around, depending on, on the on the on the quantity you are looking at. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the one of the most important things of density functional theory is that you can do these calculations for the whole nuclear charge in principle. Okay, so you can address any nucleus, the form and the form, pairing, non-pairing, so everything. And the, the problem of uh, the other the other type of models, those I call up initial. Uh, even though the uh, situation is improving very fast, uh, they cannot address any nucleus they like, and, and they have difficulties also in addressing, for example, uh, in some uh, high 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 lying inside the states, so that, for example, like you know, giant dipole or all this kind of thing. Okay, so here I give you some advantages and disadvantages, and more or less uh, all of them I I, I already mentioned. Uh, maybe the only one I, I have not mentioned is this one here. And it is that the Hohenberg cone theorem has been extended, I mean, extended, generalized in all possible conditions. So, as for time dependent uh, theories, uh, you can also have the time dependent density functional theory, of course, for the general ground state, magnetic system, finite temperature, and also in the relativistic case. Okay, so uh, since uh, the models uh, I will be presenting now uh, are uh, of uh, one specific type, let me define them very, uh, very briefly. So uh, here you see, uh, this is uh, what we call the scan type of model, which is nothing at that a low momentum transfer uh, expansion uh, of a Yukawa type of interaction. So you, we know the pion is the most important. If it goes like the interaction should be as a Yukawa, so let's expand the low momentum because the momentum we believe in nuclei to exist are low. So we then uh, do this and derive uh, an interaction. We cut at a certain at a certain let's say order. Uh, here is up to up to uh, p square, where p will be the this uh, momentum transfer, and. And here we have the interaction, and we add by hand the last term, which is the spin orbit term. This is a, this is a non-relativistic theory, so we need to add by hand the, the spin orbit. In a relativistic theory, we don't need to add by hand this this part of the function of the interaction, so the effective interaction we we are taking as a basis. And it is also useful for what we will come now, uh, that we uh, uh, calculate uh, the anti-symmetrized interaction. So this is, you can anti-symmetrize the wave function or the interaction before you calculate, for example, the hartree fock uh, expectation value of some quantity, uh, of, sorry, of the energy in that case. And, and you can split it in different channels and depending on the spin 
on the ISO spin or at the same time on the spin and, and ISO. Uh, after you take the uh, hartree fock expectation value of the interaction I just shown before, uh, you get this, and this is the energy density. This is the energy density function. It depends, as you see, on different densities. So you can also generalize, let's say, the, 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 the density functional theory or your functional to depend not only on the value on the, in this case, on the value on density, but also on the kinetic energy density, also on the derivatives of your density, and also, for example, on this J, which is the spin current. So since we have particles with spin and they can couple, so it's important also to, 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 to introduce this other density, but the theory works the same and everything is, let's say, valid. Okay, so you have already seen the phase of this functional, which is kind of, let's say, complicated, but analytical in this way. So in, very simple in reality. So now let, let's come to, to, uh, to one of the main points also of my, one of the main points, but already more specific. And it is, um, and it is uh, at some point we realized that um, uh, nuclear models, nuclear density functionals, were not very good in the description of what we call the spin ISO spin channel. So this is the spin ISO spin channel, this is the spin channel. Okay. And, and, and how we realize that? We realize that by looking at the, what we call a spin ISO spin resonances. So how the nucleus, uh, which is the nucleus response when you perturb it uh, by using, uh, let's say, spin ISO spin uh, operator. So a sigma and tau operator from the theoretical side. Uh, and, and well, this can be done experimentally, of course, uh, in, in a given way. I will not go now into detail now because it will be too long. Um, and, but you can, of course, uh, uh, perturb the nucleus in a given way. Uh, and if uh, you use uh, some uh, spin as a spin, let's say, sensitive uh, beam, uh, then you will get spin as a spin response of the nucleus and a resonance of the nucleus. And, and, and for example, the simplest one is the so-called Gamow-Teller response, which is an operator which is just sigma tau. And, and it can uh, produce, for example, I'm showing you in the right hand, hand scheme, if you take calcium 42 and you change the spin and either spin of this neutron, you get a proton in the same level. If you just change the spin, uh, the either spin, sorry. And if you change the spin and either spin, you get the same uh, uh, transformation from neutron to proton, but to the spin orbit partner of the previous, of the previous level, of the previous transition, let's say. So you, in the response, you are expecting to get two peaks, one of this transition and the another one to this transition. Of course, in nuclei, it's not that simple, never. So you get a lot of other transitions that will contribute, but essentially these two will be the, 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 the most stable in, in, in energy. And this has clear correction because this produces mirror transition as respect to the beta decay. So by studying uh, with a charge pro, with a um, strong pro, uh, by doing charge chain reaction, by studying the structure of nuclei, you will learn also about beta decay. Why? In the, in the right-hand side figure, I'm showing you two transitions in titanium-42, which are exactly the mirror transitions that you find in the, in the, in the gamma of Teller uh, spec. Uh, so this is telling you, for example, that allow gamma of Teller transitions will mainly determine beta, the half, uh, beta decay half lives. And, and this, for example, has a, a clear importance also in the astrophysical context. Uh, context. So not only learning about the spin as a spin will help us learn about uh, all this I just mentioned, but also spin as a spin resonances, since they are related to the fact that you have neutrons and protons and that and about the difference between these neutrons and protons, this will also have an impact on the equation of state and on the symmetry energy, because it's giving you also characterizing also the system uh, on the basis of this difference between neutrons and Okay, so just to give you some examples, so um, we we produce the functional which is called SAMI. Uh, I will not explain here the details, but um, I can. Uh, what we did is just to try to see what was done in the field. See that uh, it was difficult for uh, many models to describe spin as spin resonances. Select the best models uh, that describe this type of resonances, which are SK or what I call here SK O prime and SG two and try to see how you can improve the, 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 the interaction uh, in order to uh, be able to describe this spin as a spin resonance. In the left-hand side, I'm showing you the gamma of resonance. 
here it is the operator to, that you use to excite the nucleus, and in the right hand side, the spin dipole, uh, the spin dipole excitation index. And here is the operator used to excite the nucleus. So, uh, in the, in the, for example, in the left hand side figures, the gamma of tele resonance, uh, you can see the gamma of tele resonance, sorry, for calcium 48, zirconium 19, and lead 208. And in green, you find the experiment, and in uh, red and green, you find these uh, older models that were the best models up to that moment, at least in the field, in describing these spin and spin resonances. And you see that the green is, for example, in calcium 48, in uh, zirconium 90, and in lead 208, it's not very close to, the, to these, let's say, dashed lines which are just draw, uh, draw to, uh, let's say, driven your eye. This would correspond to the, um, if I take all these uh, dots here and I calculate just an histogram of one bar here, to give you one, okay? I take this just part and I, this, uh, the, it will be concentrated at this energy, uh, at this energy uh, and, uh, and sting, uh, sorry, um, marked by this, dashed line. And uh, as you see, uh, not uh, also the, 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 red, uh, the, red inter the red model, sorry, it never, it, it didn't uh, reproduce uh, well in all the cases. So it's better, for example, in the case of calcium 48 and zirconium 90 for the high energy peak, but for the low energy peak, this red part, it's kind of off. Uh, so we produce this new functional SAMI, which is the blue one, which is not, as you see, it's not perfect for all the peaks, uh, but it's improving the situation with respect to the other functionals. So we improve uh, our functional in this spin idle spin channel. And, and actually for the case of lead is the only, the only model that is able to reproduce the experiment. For the case of the spin dipole, just mention that when you look at this, the, 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 the upper, the upper uh, part, which is the total spin dipole response of the lead 208, uh, which is the sum of these three, Okay, uh, with some weights depending on the multipolarity. Uh, but you see that uh, this SAMI is already uh, producing very well this spin dipole resonance. And this is very important, why? This is very important because we know the sum rule for the so-called non-energy weighted sum rule or the spin dipole resonance, it's uh, related to the neutron skin thickness of nuclei. So again, we get a connection as I was promising you at the beginning uh, of this uh, point talking about this spin and spin resonance is that these those are also correlate, correlate, uh, um, related sorry to uh, the physics of, of for example a neutron star or to the physics of the neutron skin. Okay, so but uh, what about other channels of interaction? What about uh, if I look to isospin uh, isospin sensitive resonances, for example? No, what can I learn? So if I look, uh, so the most basic isospin resonance or pure isospin resonance is the so-called isobaric analog resonance or isobaric analog scape. And so, uh, which is, uh, as I put you here, uh, this is a purely uh, isospin resonance because the operator you used to, let's say, excite your nucleus is just the tau operator, which is nothing but uh, as the stigma operator, but in the isospin space, as I, as I said before. Okay, so uh, now uh, let me, I will show this figure later. So let me just mention a few things. First of all, this is for LED 208 again. And, and the, the measurement of this uh, isobaric analog state is done with exquisite accuracy in the experiment. So the errors uh, are uh, in the determination of the energy are of uh, the level of tens of kb. Uh, and the, the width of the resonance is at the level of hundreds of kb. So even though I plotted here the error, you couldn't see practically in this thing. So this is just the, the main, the central value, which is 18.8 uh, MeV. So if you now, just looking at the vertical scale, don't look now at the moment at the horizontal scale, just by looking at the vertical scale, you take different models that the one, as the ones we have been, I, I have been showing you up to now, uh, all of them then uh, based on density functional theory. And you see that those are many sigmas away from the experimental value. This is a well-known problem in the literature, uh, and it is an old one, if you want. It is called the Nolan Schiffer anomaly. Yeah, you probably have uh, uh, listened about, about it. And, and 
and it can be solved and it has been uh, uh, rather well understood in the past, but we have proposed uh, a new, uh, a new, let's say, strategy to solve. So first, uh, we'll Javi, you are 45 minutes through. So uh, what about if I take uh, around, I'm not sure. Okay, I will try to be, to be not very slow. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to, 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 to be clear in all the, in all the important. Sure, of course, no problem. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, let me explain you what is the isobaric analog state. So the isobaric analog state, uh, so imagine that you apply the tau operator to a nucleus. So you, what you will be doing is to exchange neutrons into protons in this case, right? So for example, think about the chromium 90, which is a very simple example in which the 1G9 half is fully occupied for the neutrons and fully empty in the proton side. So imagine now that the Coulomb interaction is not switch on and that you apply the tau, tau minus operator. So you exchange all neutrons into protons. And then you will get uh, that the excitation energy of this mode will be exactly zero. Now, if you switch on the Coulomb interaction, uh, what essentially happens in nuclei is that the all proton levels will go up more or less as a wall. Okay. So then when you apply the time minus operator, you will get an excitation energy, which will be some number. Okay. And this is in good approximation, actually, it's uh, uh, um, in very good approximation, it's the actually close to the experimental value of the isobaric analog state. But not is exactly, okay? Um, so uh, one can therefore, uh, after having uh, giving you this simple picture, one can therefore uh, define the analog state as the T minus operator acting on the ground state and conveniently normalized. Uh, and, the, the, and, and calling the displacement energy or the energy of the isobaric analog state uh, as the difference between the energy of the analog state minus the energy of the ground state. After doing that, you end up with this expression here where you see a commutator between the Hamiltonian and the T minus operator. So if my Hamiltonian is a spin symmetric, uh, this will be zero. So if there is no Coulomb interaction, for example, this will be zero. Um, as if, as you have seen clearly in this picture here. Uh, but any term in the Hamiltonian that uh, is not zero, uh, it, sorry, uh, it does not commute with the tau minus operator, with the isospin operator, uh, then it will contribute to the isobaric analog state. So already when this uh, problem I've shown you in one of the pictures before uh, was uh, seen by, by this Nolan and Schiffer, uh, some of the people try to understand which are the contribution, the contributions that might be important to describe the isobaric analog state. So they realize the, the, the actually the Coulomb direct and exchange part contributions, let's say, to this observable are the leading ones. Actually, the direct part is leading uh, because it's 20, around 20 MeV. Uh, this for, sorry, they did the estimation for the 208 and the experimental value is 15.8. Then they found out that the other leading contributions, apart from the very leading contribution, which is the Coulomb direct, they found the Coulomb exchange and the isospin symmetry breaking from the nuclear uh, strong interaction. So here, uh, when you are studying the isobaric analog state, you cannot anymore use a Hamiltonian, which is isospin symmetric. So isospin symmetry is a very well conserved uh, symmetry in nuclei, uh, and it has very little effect if you want to and it's breaking has very little effect. You want to check uh, or to study nuclear masses or char D or, or giant resonances. But if you want to, to check or to look this, I, specifically this isospin resonance, the isobaric analog state, it is very sensitive to that effect. So you can also learn about the isospin symmetry breaking in nuclei by looking at this observer. Uh, okay. So uh, what we did just before to un better understand this problem is to, okay, since we know the leading term is the Coulomb direct, so let's assume the Coulomb direct calculate the very uh, analog state energy by using the formula, sorry, the formula, this formula here, and uh, ad adopting a very simple, uh, let's say, uh, Coulomb uh, interaction. So we assume that you have a, a hard, uh, the Coulomb interaction, um, Sorry, sorry, the charge density of the nucleus is uh, a kind of hard sphere. And, and then we calculate this energy of the isobaric analog state. And we end up realizing that this should be ruled, or the main contribution, which is the Coulomb direct term, should be ruled by the neutral spin angle. So this is a proof in a simple terms that we may expect 
by uh, if we believe on this simple model on the connection between the isobaric analog state and the neutral skin and therefore also to the neutron pressure, the position of state and, and so on. So here is the figure again I've shown you before in which you see that all these energy density functionals actually follow this linear correlation with the neutral skin, meaning that this equation, this uh, simple equation I'm giving you here is physically, let's say, meaningful. Uh, but uh, okay, this is uh, very interesting because we also we have just connected the the isobaric kind of state energy with the equation of state, and we have connected also with isospin symmetry breaking. Okay, but these two things doesn't seem to agree in our models because no model is able to reproduce experimental data. On the other side, one may think, okay, so let me extend this line and find a model that will predict that. Neutron skin in, in LED. Again, this is LED, sorry. I'm talking about all the time about LED. Uh, let, me pre let me take a model that predicts a very small neutron skin for LED, but this will be in contradiction with all these other experiments here. Okay. So uh, the, the reason why is by, because all this model does not contain this isospin symmetry breaking term for the reasons I mentioned before. And therefore, what we did is just to include in this function all those, uh, all those terms. So those terms, just to be uh, to be specific, are um, uh, the Coulomb exchange in, a, in an exact way. So usually our functionals, this functional does not contain the Coulomb part exchange part calculated exactly. So what we did is to provide the exact calculation. Uh, we take into account the electromagnetic spin orbit uh, between protons. So not only the nuclear one, there is also the electromagnetic part. And then we take into account that the neutrons and protons are have a finite size electromagnetic size. This is also neglected commonly in uh, this type of functionals. Why? It is neglected because usually it has very little effect on the observables we are used to study. Finally, we also correct the Coulomb potential by the so-called vacuum polarization correction, which is the lowest order correction to the finite structure constant. And this also has some effect on the isobaric analog state. And finally, uh, the, the, the one of the most relevant uh, parts uh, is this uh, isospin symmetry breaking on the nuclear core. While all the corrections that I have been talking up to now are corrections which are model independent because they are, are all connected to the Coulomb interaction, in, the, in this case, when you introduce uh, the isospin symmetry breaking in the nuclear part, yeah, you need to postulate some terms in your functional, which are new, that break isospin symmetry, and that has some parameters and need to be fixed, okay? And uh, we propose the simplest possible uh, in, uh, interaction based on the square answers, which depends only on two parameters. And then we need to decide where to fit it. But that was actually uh, uh, partially a problem. So we have a lot of data on the experimental energy with this very kind of state, but we also wanted to see if some, let's say those up initial models that we believe are more fundamental somehow, uh, if what they say about, about this uh, isospin symmetry breaking. Okay, so the only information we could take about the question of state on isospin symmetry breaking effects, it was a, a work made by Mutter and Falls that you know, uh, that, 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 it's, uh, that you know very well. Oops, sorry. And let me see what, okay. And it was this, this, this dots here. So they calculate the contribution to the symmetric matter equation of state due to isospin symmetry breaking. So we fitted the points, which are this line blue here, and uh, to fix the other parameter, because we have two new parameters, and to fit the other parameters, we fit the uh, excitation energy that's very kind of state in there. And we produce, and we produce a new model, which is called the SAMI ISB. And now the SAMI ISB is compatible regarding uh, available experiments on the neutron skin in there. And it's compatible also with the excitation energy of the isobaric analog state. Uh, what does, uh, what does uh, for example, this, uh, sorry, uh, is this improving uh, this new model also when you uh, predict other uh, energies of the isobaric analog state? Because this, the, the one in LED has been fitted, so it is normal that you reproduce it. So when you look at another nuclei, for example, we look at the thin chain. and this is the blue, the, 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 the old uh, model, SAMI, and in red, the new model, SAMI ISB. And you are not, you, you are not perfect because this uh, isospin symmetry breaking interactions we put in are very simple. 
uh, but we were uh, we were improving their production uh, the reproduction uh, a lot and okay what will happen if i uh, briefly apply these uh, two models to neutral stars uh, just to connect what we have said at the very beginning and what we uh, for example uh, what we learned is the following so on the one side i'm showing you your full completeness the equations of state so the symmetric the equation of state in the lower part and the neutral matter equation of state in the higher part. Uh, in blue, SAMI, and in green, SAMI ISP. You see that those are similar, but they start to depart when you go to very, very large densities. Here you are around, at around maybe three, four times saturation densities. And if you try to take these equations of state and try to solve the mass radio relation for a neutral star, you will see already some differences. Okay, you see already that there is some difference. Don't look at the lower part because we didn't modelize the crust uh, uh, properly. So this, me, uh, this gives you this uh, very funny shape. So in principle, if you modelize the crust properly, the, the here around 111 uh, kilometers, maybe it will go up directly without doing this kind of Z shape. But the point here was not to do a, a, a very accurate calculation. The point here was to see the differences between the different predictions. For example, if you compare the green line with the brown line, the green line is the SAMI ISB, the brown line is SAMI ISB, so the same model, but with the two parameters on the ISB, on the adjustment symmetry breaking sector, set to zero. So this, this effect here of few hundreds of meters in a neutral star uh, of around 1.4 solar masses, which is usually the standard uh, neutral star, you will get already a non, let's say, negligible, uh, non negligible. Uh, contribution. So that was the, let's say, the, the main point. Uh, with that, uh, and, and asking you, let's say, um, uh, and apologizing for the for the long for the long seminar. So uh, with that, I conclude. Let me just let me just, if I have uh, just one minute, let me just tell you about about some 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 lines that we are now studying. Uh, uh, for example, we are uh, trying to address the so-called inverse Konishan problem, which is not to uh, assume some Konishan problem, solve it and then see, and then fill the parameters, but to take the, uh, one can do also, uh, to take the experimental densities and to invert the Konishan equation to find the Konishan potential, and then to derive from experiment or from other more, let's say, accurate calculations, for example, on some given specific cases in which we know we can do very good calculations to find which should be the functional in these cases and then to extend it maybe to more complicated and difficult and difficult system. Uh, this, we have been uh, doing this with some uh, bachelor and master thesis students here in the, in the, in the red box. Uh, we are also trying with a PhD now, uh, trying to follow the path set by uh, in condensed matter in the study of electronic systems uh, by uh, trying to apply the same strategy but in nuclear physics this has been never done before in nuclear physics and we believe it may be worth to try also this this path uh, finally uh, we are also interested in checking uh, the many body techniques we are using for example the hatri fog the time dependent hatri fog or other more complicated approaches we are we are also using apart from uh, let's say the pure density functional uh, we like also to see if these meaning uh, methods are uh, meaningful and what we have done is to extend the, the so-called harmonic potential theorem also to be used to interactions which are uh, commonly found in uh, nuclear physics uh, and finally uh, we are also trying to to simplify up to the uh, highest possible level uh, the nuclear Hamiltonian uh, in order to apply different many body methods and see uh, which are the difference in, for example, a solvable bomb model. For example, if you simplify a lot your Hamiltonian but still contains the main physics you want to study, uh, then uh, you can apply and, and if you choose your Hamiltonian in a clever way, you may solve it exactly. And then you can check different many-body approaches you are used to, to use in your field and then see which are the deficiencies, which are the connections between them. And, and you can learn, learn from that. This has been also done uh, by, by, by the help of a master thesis student and a, and a postdoc here that I would like to, 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 to thank very much. 
and, and, and here I just give you the, the slide with the, with the main collaborators. So thank you very much. And again, I apologize for the long talk. Thank you, Xavi. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, I can see Jordi has his hand up. Jordi, you want to unmute yourself and... Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Xavier, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask that, uh, so you have uh, told us a lot of things about the theory of nuclear physics that uh, applies to the interiors of neutron stars. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, potential observations and constraints that one can obtain about uh, neutron stars. So for example, including not just the mass radius relationship, but also you know, things like um, uh, the glitches that are observed in radio astronomy, uh, you know, the evolution and the, when you have a large magnetic field, mm -hmm. uh, things like uh, gravitational waves, the tidal torque. So uh, I wanted to ask, what do you think are the most promising lines of connecting these observations to the, the physics of the interiors? And are you involved in trying to understand some of these observations or data? Do you think uh, there's some promising uh, well, lines of research here? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, about the uh, which would be the most promising observations. Uh, this um, it's uh, difficult to answer, but I have seen that uh, gravitational wave signals. As long as we start to get more uh, more information, so maybe just one. Um, uh, uh, maybe I go to the slide. It would be easier. So, for example, uh, you see. For example, let's start by the mass. If you observe the mass, the, the mass uh, at, the, at the time uh, we saw the, the maximum mass uh, to be at two solar masses, it ruled out many, many equations of state. So, uh, to, uh, and if we have seen a two solar mass, uh, why we should think we are so lucky to found the heaviest one in the, in the, in the universe, right? So, uh, so this uh, maximum solar mass is setting already a lot of constraints because uh, many of the models I'm showing you, these uh, density functional theory models, are very... Um, are very, are, not all of them are very soft, let's say. So if you want, I will put it in the following way. So many of the nuclear models uh, based on experiments on Earth, um, let's say uh, indicates that the question of state at larger densities should be softer than what we would expect if we look just observation. So there is some kind of tension uh, that we need to solve. And therefore, for example, the mass would be, uh, the, 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 to, to seek for, for heavier masses would be a good option. Then I think uh, also the regarding uh, gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are not putting a tight constraint on the tidal polar stability or on the radius, not a very tight one. Uh, they are actually ruling out some models. So this is uh, also true and very important. But I believe when we start to get more and more, more information, we will be put and we will be able to put set, uh, tighter constraint, constraints on the radius of the star which are merging and, and, and on the, this tidal polarizability, so about this deformation of the star, uh, this will be also very important to me. Uh, regarding glitches, um, I actually uh, not an expert about glitches. Uh, I just uh, now started with a master's student, and maybe you know Pierre Pizzocchero, which is a professor in our department, to study, uh, to study uh, vortices in the, in the inner crust that may be an explanation for the glitches. So the, con the interaction between bodies in the in, in nuclear in the crust that may be uh, an explanation for these vortices, and 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 but this at the moment I I don't know uh, for example the study of glitches how may help us about the equation of state because I didn't become uh, very conversant yet with this topic, uh, so I will bet based on my experience on the gravitational waves the maximum mass uh, the maximum mass measurement at the moment. Um, but there are other, of course, many other observables that should be and will be sensitive. And but at the moment, I will I will wait for those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the radii. I mean, of course, you can determine masses, so you could determine maybe the distribution of masses, not just the maximum. Also, the radii are more difficult sure. to observe, a lot more difficult, right? Sure, sure. sure. Uh, no, the, the best thing will be to determine masses and radius at the same time, like nicer recently, yeah. that they measure both at the same time. That would be amazingly good. Uh, because then you can uh, observe the, the, all this curve here. Let's say you can observe it, and if you can observe it for different masses, that would be even better. But since I know it is difficult, that's why, that's why I was pushing to, the, to just the mass, 
that and see and see if we can get some some consent from there. But yeah, if, if I if I may ask, yeah, mass and radius at the same time would be the best. But I think uh, David has his hand up as well. Uh, you are muted, David. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for telling me. I was muted. Uh, so th thanks, uh, Xavier, for your talk. Uh, I don't know if we have ever really met in person because I, I arrived in Barcelona just before you left. Uh, you, can put, think... you can put your picture. I, don't, I cannot see your face. Ah, really? Because I my video is on. Uh, yeah. It, maybe if you stop presenting. Yeah. I can see you and I can see Jordi and I can see myself. Ah, maybe now you can see me. Okay, now I see you. Now I see. Okay, you. perfect. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about this huge uncertainty in the equation of state that you mentioned at high densities mm -hmm. um, about some work that you may not be aware of. Um, so if you require three things, one is that the, the equation of state at low densities is the one predicted by the Carroll Lagrangian, uh -huh. and that at high densities, at asymptotically high densities, it goes over to the QCD equation of state that you can compute in perturbation theory. Uh -huh. And you also impose that the equation of state is stable, meaning that the pressure is a monotonically increasing function of the energy density. Then you can constrain the equation of state with a, no more than a 30% uh, uncertainty everywhere at all densities. Okay, and, and, and uh, which are, okay. So you, you assume the chiral part up to which density, sorry? To up to the density that you trust the chiral Lagrangian. Okay. So uh, you, you, the point is that you know the low density behavior mm -hmm. from effective field theory. You know the high density behavior from QCD. Uh -huh. And this is very constraining if you then impose stability, which means that you have to go from the lowest okay. uh, Lagrangian to the QC equation of state, monotonically increasing. Okay. okay. This is very constraining. And in fact, it's so constraining that you, you know the equation of state with no more than 30% uncertainty everywhere. Okay. So this is some, some work by the Finnish group by Kurkela and Borinen and company. Uh -huh. No, I, I've seen. Uh, I have seen actually. Uh, that there are there exist different atoms in this in this way. Let's say different, not 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 exactly like like you you show you, you just explain us that which seems let's say uh, very well uh, very well done. I would say, uh, but uh, the point here is that there are different. Even though you can do uh, much better than what I showed here, uh, which will be what you just explained to us. Um, and there are different issues we need to learn. For example, uh, does this uh, question of state allow for phase transitions that uh, probably will take place in the in the star? Or uh, this chiral Lagrangian that you took. So if you, I didn't show here, but if you took uh, different chiral Lagrangians and you look at the question of state, you will not like what you see. So in the sense that you, they, they, are, they do not uh, agree within 30%. Uh, they, they are not that good, let's say. Of course, if you take just one, then I agree with you. You rely on this kind of interaction uh, um, on a given 10%, let's say. Uh, but if you start to look at different different kind of interactions, so I don't enter into the into looking at other interactions. So just focusing on kind of, kind of, uh, interactions, we have seen that they depend on the cutoff of the effective of the effective like, of the effective theory. So you need to when you when you derive these effective theories, you need to put a cutoff. And we have seen that those theories are not still as good as we like. Let's say we would like these theories to be better and not to depend on the cutoff you put. Because if you uh, build up a, a, an effective theory and and the the answer depends on your cutoff, you are doing something wrong. So you know you are doing something wrong already. So on this sense, we need to learn a lot. This is not. This doesn't mean these these chiral interactions are not good. They are very good, and they describe many observables in, in in nuclear physics. But there is still some some room for improvement. Is on the one side. On the other side, there is this issue: what what happens in between, right? Between I don't know two times saturation density, where you believe uh, up to which you believe uh, chiral effective uh, theories uh, at the low part, and QCD. So in the in this middle part. Uh, different species can appear, phase transitions. We have no idea. 
uh, of course, to 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 assume uh, to assume as you mentioned mechanical stability of the star is the less you can do. That, that's I agree. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Just to address very quickly what you're saying, um, of course, the Kyle Lagrangian has a re regime of validity, mm -hmm. and anything that depends on the cutoff is outside the regime of validity of the effective theory by definition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they take that into account. Um, uh -huh. And concerning phase transitions, mm -hmm. it, that's actually included in their analysis because if you have a phase transition, that your the the constraint is even stronger. Okay, sure. You're, you're jumping fast, let's say, discontinuously from one density to another. Mm -hmm. So that's included. The one thing I would say uh, mm -hmm. about their analysis is that it's very powerful precisely because it doesn't need to know what is the phase that's realized even at the core. No, this I agree. You're just requiring stability of the of the star. Mm -hmm. um, but I would I would say that the the other side of the coin is precisely that it doesn't teach you what is it? If there is a phase transition, what is the new phase at the in the high density regime, which we would like to understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was more or less my point. Uh, the, my point was this: that that's very nice, but then we don't know what is uh, behind. Yeah, we don't know which which is the the state of matter in this yeah. region, and therefore we cannot model make a model somehow. We we know maybe how it is the question of a state of a neutral star, but we cannot go farther. This is, this is right. Yeah, and, and please, if you can, uh, you can send me the reference in the chat, for example, I will agree. I will, I will, I will thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Of course. Good, are there any other questions? I can see Benjamin has his hand raised. And... Uh, yes, actually, yes, I have uh, one comment, or I mean, at, at least also one question. So, if you go back, I mean, it's difficult with this screen because we cannot see the. Sure, sure, sure. I share the screen. Yeah. It's a bit slow, eh? Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay. I think you can see now. Yeah. If you go back to the table where you give the importance of all the terms uh, in your like the Coulomb and... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, right? Yeah. So um, first, uh, I'm not I'm not sure. Maybe you said, but uh, I, I didn't get it. Uh, for the Coulomb exchange, in your model, you use like the Slater approximation or... Mm -hmm. Yes, usually in nuclear physics, we use Slater approximation. Yeah, but so, because I see, for it's one of my questions, like when I see uh, this, I see that the, the, the importance of the Coulomb exchange and uh, isospin symmetry breaking are quite small. Yes. So wouldn't it be better to use like, for example, the, the, the exact Coulomb? Uh, because when you have like differences of like 300 keV, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it starts to be, uh, relevant or important to to have the best description possible. You are completely right. You are completely right. And the best thing, and the thing, so the best thing. I mean, the thing we did first, it was to take out our approximation, Slater approximation in our functional, and to calculate the Coulomb in an exact way. So in the in the calculations I just showed, the Coulomb is calculated exactly. Mm, okay. So I, if I show this picture here, so. And let me see. Those are those models here in the in the in the line. Let's say all of those contain the Coulomb interaction and the Coulomb exchange in Slater approximation, which is the traditional way. Mm. And here, this one has the Coulomb interaction uh, exactly. So, had, so sorry, the exchange part, so the fog part, calculated exactly. Okay, and the, the contribution is very important. Actually, as you mentioned, this contribution is very important. And um, so also, I don't know, because for me, it's like when I see uh, isospin symmetry breaking, which is like a difference of 250 kV, I'm not sure I would trust my, my functional, or I mean, to, 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 be, to be able to, I mean, it, it's so small that yeah. I'm not sure functional or, or model are, are that precise. No, uh, if you are you are right, but we are looking at the dubari canon of state, which is very sensitive. So if I look at masses, I will do like you. So I will forget about the spin symmetry breaking because it, the effect will be so my functional will be not as accurate, impossible to be as accurate. Okay, 
But when I'm looking to, when I go and look to this, uh, to this observable, so the difference, for example, between, I don't know, if you like this model, SKIQ, these are non-relativistic energy density functional, and I would need uh, one MeV more. And now you see that our functionals already are expected to be better in the description of this hydrobaric analog state than one MeV, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So then when you look and uh, when you, let's say, when you select the, the right observable, and then you may be lucky and be able to uh, constrain the right channel of your function, let's say, somehow. Of course, if I use masses and radii, I forget about the spin symmetry breaking. It has no, no effect, given the accuracy of this type of model. But if I look at the barrican log state, then it's another issue. Mm, okay. I mean, I, I don't know, know the comment about also I mean, about the, the so when the con theorem because we we like to justify uh, what we do with the uh, with this theorem but are we really always using like in our framework we never fully mm -hmm. uh, comply with all the assumptions for example related to to I think one of the strong assumptions maybe I'm wrong maybe there is an extension that mm -hmm. deals with that. Uh, is the respect of, of symmetries of the problem that we break uh, almost always, at least, but I don't know for the, mm -hmm. I mean, for the ISO symmetry breaking, it's, it's, it's clear, but uh, so can we, I mean, I, I get the point of using this as a, because it's, I mean, it, it is pedagog pedagogical, but in, in another way, it's like, we are never really fully use it. I mean, we are always breaking some things and we do not work in the center of mass reference frame mm -hmm. or this kind of thing. So we, are, we never have all the condition necessary to, yes. to fully realize. The... You, are, you are completely right. So we need to, the first thing we need to do when we build a functional is to preserve the symmetries of the problem. Otherwise, I mean, you start with the wrong foot, let's say. Mm. But uh, so things are not easy always. And what we do is to not to, at the very beginning, maybe it's not to try to build the exact energy density functional, but to build some approximation to it. And of yeah. course, it may have problems. You may, uh, you may break a number particle, uh, the, the number of, so you may not conserve the number of particles. You may uh, not conserve different things. Um, we, try, uh, we try to improve all those things, let's say little by little, in my opinion. Okay. So we try to find a good starting point uh, and then to try to improve. But of course, you are right. We need to, we need to deal with, uh, with all these, uh, let's say, small problems that some functional have. Like, for example, in the past, maybe depending on the functional you propose, maybe you are not, you are not fulfilling Galilean invariance, which is not good. I mean, so. Yeah, but I mean, the way functional, so I mean, because you, you, you work, for example, I mean, the basic one will be the uh, center of mass. You you do not respect it, so you have this source of uh, of uh, of symmetry breaking that is not directly related, let's say, to the to the functional center of mass. There are some words that deal with yeah. that. Yeah, I know, but we never use it. <laughs> I mean, we, we, there are, there is at least I know at least one paper that proves that you can do it. Mm -hmm. physics but you we never work in this in this framework so it's uh, no, because, no, a bit misleading i mean to, to my in my opinion no, no because for us for example if you want to calculate masses you know how to subtract the epicenter of mass effect so you don't you are not very much worried about the effect of this on the mass yeah, or you are not much uh, and that, that i agree i mean you can correct the energy but it's the different problems and saying we we have the oh, you, you are right you are right there are there are many problems we need to solve uh, and we need to go little by little and at the moment at the moment i should be uh, let's say honest uh, and at the moment i concentrated more on other topics but you are fully right so also these other symmetries needs to be carefully taken into account sure. mm -hmm. okay guys thank thank you very thank much you. i think i'm gonna uh, are there any other final questions? If not, I think we're uh, going to stop it here.
Um, thank you, Chavi, thank you. Uh, very much for your broad uh, introduction. And sorry, I apologize. Thank you. I'm very sorry about that. That's all right. No, no worries. Um, I'll see you all in uh, two weeks' time. Uh, we have an exciting seminar on hadronic physics by Ransan Mattia. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hello. Thank you very much, Xavier. Hello. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Ciao, Xavier. Bye. 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 Bye.